Hi all, welcome back to 5WH. My name's Joe, and I like to talk about world events beyond the headlines. Covid, Trump and Brexit will appear only where strictly necessary, and I hope you'll enjoy hearing about some things that most news organisations skip on over. As always, I'm offering this in the 5WH format, asking the questions of what, who, when, where, why and how, and the order of these may vary according to topic. These questions should give you a bottom line up front and provide some useful context should you choose to dig further. They're also, hopefully, going to prevent me vanishing down too many rabbit holes. Today, we'll be bouncing back towards Africa to have a look at the recent outbreak of conflict between Ethiopia's federal government and the regional government of the Tigray region. So, as we normally do, we're going to jump in and start with our what. Ethiopian forces have recently commenced offensive operations into the Tigray region in order to defeat the TPLF, or the Tigray People's Liberation Front, a regional militia come insurgency tied to the dominant local political party. In the week or so since the conflict had been raging, there have been extensive reports of atrocities reported by both local authorities and non-governmental organisations such as Amnesty International. The consensus at present is that the worst of these killings have been conducted by the TPLF, including incidents of the mass killing of civilians. In response to violence, large numbers of civilians have fled the area into neighbouring regions and across the international border into Sudan, disproportionately women and children. While the numbers currently are estimated to measure in the tens of thousands, it is uh, estimated by local officials and NGOs with expertise in the area that upwards of 200,000 may have crossed the border in the coming days. The conflict has had the additional effect of causing significant disruption to the deliveries of food aid upon which a significant portion of the local population relies. Other than that, details remain scant as phone and internet access to the region have been cut off by the government during the assault. Outside of Tigray, in Ethiopia as a whole, public opinion towards the operation appears to be neutral to positive, although this is very early days and the Ethiopian government appears to be tightly controlling the narrative. And moving on to the where, we'll get ourselves settled in geospatially. Ethiopia is a large landlocked country in the Horn of Africa, to the eastern side of the continent. It is generally sparsely cultivated, but supports a population of between 110 and 115 million citizens. Working from the north and in a clockwise direction, Ethiopia is surrounded by Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, South Sudan and Sudan. The national capital and the seat of government is Addis Ababa, located roughly in the centre of the country, bordering the Great Rift Valley and hundreds of kilometres south of Tigray. Tigray, the province we're most focused on today, is the northernmost area of the country, with borders to Eritrea and Sudan. It is identified individually as Region 1 in Ethiopia's constitution and has its local capital at Mekele and a total population of around 5 million people, the majority of which are ethnic Tigray. So now it's time to jump into our when. Without going too far, we need to have some deeper historical context. Until 2018, Ethiopia was ruled by minority ethnic Tigray government, a legacy of its civil and revolutionary wars and other instances where it became a flashpoint between superpowers during the Cold War. The 2018 election resulted in the election of an ethnic Oromo as Prime Minister, a member of the largest but non-majority ethnic group in the country and the commencement of a democratic peace reform which earned that Prime Minister a Nobel Peace Prize. Since then, however, these green shoots have started to decay, with tensions between the ethnic Tigray elite and the new government ratcheting up. In September 2020, the government issued instructions to delay local elections due to the risk posed by COVID-19 combined with large gatherings of people. The local government in Mekele acted in defiance of this directive and conducted its elections anyway. This resulted in the federal government seeking to cut the Tigray government out of the budget and uh, circumvent it by assigning funds directly to local councils. The Mekela government then countered this by withholding tax receipts earmarked for Addis Ababa. This escalated throughout September and October, with upwards of 500 ethnic Tigray activists and officials arrested throughout the month, particularly in a batch prior to the Iricha festival. More recently, in early November, government forces were allegedly attacked by the TPLF. The TPLF was alleged to have launched a raid on a federal barracks in Tigray as part of an effort to seize materiel and munitions. In response, the government deployed federal troops to commence operations against the TPLF in Tigray. It is worth noting, however, 
that unverified reports suggest that federal troops were massed outside Tigray immediately prior to this alleged provocation, suggesting that the TPLF raid may have been a bit of a uh, canned goods situation as per Germany and Poland in 1939, and actually a situation created and manufactured to give the federal government a casus belli or cause for war. Although the conflict is currently only about a week and a half old, uh, we've had some significant atrocities, most recently on or about the 10th of November. Uh, dates are sketchy. As I've said previously, communications have been cut off to this region. Uh, upwards of 100 local labourers were killed uh, in, in Tigray. These were reportedly day labourers with absolutely no part in the conflict. Uh, and this reportedly followed on from a panicked retreat by Tigrayan forces in the face of federal troops. I don't want to be reporting uh, Ethiopian propaganda, however, and this is not entirely clear. The only thing that we can say for certain is that these people were killed. The actual actor behind it remains somewhat unclear. So now we need to expand on our who and look at some of the key actors and groups behind this conflict. We'll start off with the Ethiopian federal government. The federal government is presently headed by Prime Minister Abe Ahmed, an ethnic Oromo and leader of the Oromo Democratic Party, itself the leading faction of the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. As mentioned before, Abe Ahmed is a Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, immediately following the success of his election in 2018. The Oromo are Ethiopia's dominant ethnic group, totaling approximately 35 million, or about 30% of the population. The obvious but essential point I'd like to draw from this fact is that political parties in Ethiopia remain predominantly tied to ethnicity, as well as the geographic region from which they stem, rather than any sort of higher political ideals or concepts. This, as a result, has the effect of making conflicts between these parties significantly more heated, as rather than simply discussing the abstract allocation of resources, there is generally a very clear, perceived anyway, winner or loser in the arrangements made and thus making it more susceptible to uh, violent inflammation, such as what we're seeing now. And now we'll have a quick look at the Ethiopian federal government's armed forces, particularly the army as the key actor in any sort of land war or counterinsurgency. The leader is technically the Prime Minister, Ahmed. He holds the office of Commander-in-Chief under the Ethiopian constitution. The highest military position, however, is the Chief of the General Staff, Behan Ujula, he has previously served as the head of UN missions in Sudan and South Sudan, and also Liberia prior to that. He has called this conflict pointless in uh, recent public comments, however this appears to be in reference to the Tigray resistance rather than any indication of his own personal lack of resolve. The army itself is presently estimated to total about 140,000 troops, divided into four regional commands and an additional strategic reserve located around the capital. Each of these commands consists, in turn, of one mechanised division and between four and six non-mechanised light infantry divisions, with the uh, Central Strategic Reserve also holding key strategic assets, signals and other supporting arms like that. However, the fact that these commands are themselves regional, in terms of their geographical location, does not reflect the areas from which those troops are drawn and it is suggested that Tigrayan troops make up a significant portion of the fighting strength, particularly in their premier mechanised infantry formations. Some estimates place this uh, Tigray domination of the armed forces at close to 50%. This ethnic fault line in the armed forces may be of relevance when we're discussing why this conflict has erupted shortly. Without meaning to uh, demean them, the Air Force is unfortunately the poor cousin in this regard, with an estimated 3,000 personnel. In terms of kit and equipment, uh, these troops have been equipped by the Soviet Union, later Russian Federation, and also China uh, since the 70s. Generally, however, a lot of this equipment is in a poor state of repair, with limited repair or replacement following a uh, somewhat strenuous war with Eritrea. So now we need to talk about our other antagonist, the TPLF. The TPLF is presently headed by the chairman, Debrecen Gebre Michel and holds 35 of the 547 seats in the National House of People's Representatives and all 152 seats in the local Mekele government in Tigray region. The TPLF's influence is strongly tied to its success 
in leading the revolutionary conflict against the autocratic PDRE throughout the 20th century and culminating in 1991. Subsequently, this power base was cemented by its own domination of Ethiopia's government. In terms of fighting power, troops and equipment for the TPLF, this is a somewhat challenging topic to address. A key part of Ethiopian nation building was an effort to integrate the various armed factions into the national armed forces. This in turn led to a situation which, as alluded to earlier, a significant portion of Ethiopian troops belonged to the ethnic Tigray group. This means that not only is the loyalty of the Ethiopian army to the federal government uncertain, but it also means that there is no distinct TPLF force, at least at present. It is likely that the organisation is primarily an insurgent-based organisation at present. However, we could see defections from the Ethiopian federal forces in the near future, and those units are likely to bring their kit and equipment across with them, giving parity in terms at least of firepower and equipment, if not personnel, to the TPLF. So now we need to talk about why, and more specifically, why now? I think when we were talking through the timeline earlier, that you should probably have gotten a broad idea of the themes behind this, but I think some of them need reiterating. We're looking at a state where politics is closely tied to ethnic concerns and regional origin. We're also looking at a state where a former minority elite has only recently been removed from power and uh, now dominates only its geographical region of origin. However, as a carryover from previously dominating the regime, the Tigray ethnic group still maintains extensive influence and power over key parts of the Ethiopian state, particularly the armed forces, as well as other government branches throughout the country. While the end of Tigray minority rule may be seen objectively as a measure to spread power more equitably throughout the population, we can see from numerous instances in history that social groups are much more likely to respond negatively when perceived rights or privileges are withdrawn from them than when they are not granted in the first place. In this regard, that although it may be equitable to reduce the privileges the Tigray possessed, it is not reasonable to expect them to take that lightly. We can therefore assess with some certainty that some clashing of heads was almost certain, although mismanagement by the federal government, particularly with regards to the local elections, appears to have brought that to a head. We must also consider that the federal government may have felt this was the last possible moment they could reasonably act. Over the last few months, we've seen an increase in political arrests of Tigray officials and activists, and during the first week, week and a half of the war, this has been followed by extensive arrests of Tigrayan officers within the armed forces, suggesting that the government may have felt that some sort of coup or other sort of seditious activity was in the offing, regardless of their actions. This in turn may have led to their somewhat impetuous actions regarding local elections, and also the uh, construction of a narrative to enable them to deploy armed force into the Tigray province. This is not to make a valued judgement on either side. The truth of this will probably not come out for months, if at all. However, it is important to understand how both sides in this conflict may have felt little choice prior to the escalation to armed conflict over the past couple of weeks. You'll notice so far that I've somewhat glossed over the how, but I think the timeline and the discussion of why just now pretty evenly cover what we know of the mechanics of this to date. Um, with any luck, I'll be able to give an update on this in a few months as more facts become apparent, but hopefully this will be enough for you to uh, launch your water cooler discussions going forward. In conclusion, the military operations in Ethiopia, particularly the Tigray province, appear to be the result of a boiling over of ethnic tensions in a country that remains divided following minority rule. The record of atrocities so early in the conflict does not bode well for a peaceful or amenable conclusion, but we can hope. Particularly given the previous employment of Ethiopian troops in UN missions, we can hope that international arbitration will be both rapidly forthcoming and also accepted by all sides. Other than that, I'm afraid, I think we're going to have to see where the die lands. So uh, that's me again for another episode of 5WH. I would like to thank all of you for listening this far. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the follow or subscribe button or whatever platform you're using. And leave us a review if the option exists. And I would love for you to join me on Facebook or Instagram. Just search 5WH and uh, get involved. I'd love, love to hear what you think. Cheers, thanks, and uh, see you all soon.